Good morning. This is going to be a, a little video about the concept of density. A basic concept of density is that you have a mass distributed out over a distance, a plane, or a given volume, and you want to um, find out, get a measure of how much mass is in a tiny region of that in any tiny portion of that region. In general, the density of an object will vary with the position within it. It might be more dense on one side than another. So I might take a functional approach saying that the linear density varies with x, the area density varies with x and y, and the volume density varies with x, y, and z. Now, I'm not sure where I got the idea to represent volume density with a rho, a area density with a sigma, and linear density with a lambda. It was a habit I got from somewhere, so it's probably what they're typically using on Wikipedia. Yes, definitely on Wikipedia they use rho to represent the volume, volumetric mass density, mass per unit area, and mass per unit volume, I'm sorry. And yes, under linear density, I see they use lambda. But for area density, I was wrong. They do not use uh, they do not use sigma. Rather, they use rho sub a. So where did I get the idea to use sigma as area density? That comes from page 574 of our own text comes from page 574 of Sir Wave Wheel's College Physics, where they are discussing how to figure the capacitance based on Gauss's law around a plane of uniform charge. And that planar charge has a uniform planar charge density of sigma. So let's make this distinction. Here I am talking about linear, planar, and volumetric, volumetric mass density. But the book uses sigma to refer to a planar charge density. So each of these could be referred to a linear mass density or a linear charge density, um, depending on the context of the problem. A planar mass and charge density and a volumetric mass or charge density. So the units on lambda, depending on whether you're talking, discussing a mass or charge density, would be uh, kilograms per meter or coulombs per meter. This would be kilograms per meter squared for sigma or coulombs per meter squared, depending on the context of the problem. And this would be kilograms per meter cubed or coulombs per meter cubed, depending on the context of the problem. Now, I think the textbook writers have decided not to use rho as the symbol for volumetric charge density. Instead, they use the symbol n. Now, I don't like the use of n for density. I think it should be reserved for a number of particles or objects or wavelengths, something that is inherently countable. Density is not an inherently countable quantity. Its meaning changes greatly with the scale of the unit in the denominator. If I say something, for instance, water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, there is a strong, though false, implication that the density should be uniform over the space of a cubic meter. If I have a swimming pool full of water, you can see lots of little chunks in there of cubic meters, little regions that are um, actually a cubic meter of water and it has a, a mass of 1,000 kilograms. However, if you take out a little thimble full of water, um, you still have a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, even though you don't have a cubic meter and you don't have nearly 1,000 kilograms. What we have here is the concept of an incompressible fluid. In a true fluid, 
you can talk about the density of the material at a given point. Even though technically at the given point, there is no meter cubed. There is no cubic centimeter. There, there is no cubic meter, nanometer even. There is nothing at all at the given point. Because a point is a geometrically dimensionless object. Yet in the fluid conceptualization of density, we go ahead and say that the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And we pretend, we say that has a meaning at the geometric point where the volume is shrunk down to zero. But in reality, matter has a particulate structure. Water, for instance, consists of two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom with electrons swirling around. When you start talking about the density of the water in terms of kilograms per cubic nanometer and per cubic picometer, um, it is no longer a homogeneous fluid but a changing landscape. But in general, whenever we talk about the charge density of a substance or the mass density of a substance, we will be treating it as a fluid. For a moment, let's look at a much larger example. This image is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is a map of all the galaxies discovered with redshifts of less than 0.14. Now there are notable blank areas in the diagram, and I think those are either due to the lack of a telescope pointing in those directions, or the fact that the bulk of the Milky Way galaxy is in the way, preventing us from seeing any galaxies in those directions. But the point is that this is what cosmologists call a homogeneous distribution of galaxies. However, anybody with the slightest compulsion to nitpick would point, would point out that there appear to be large wisps of galaxies here, here, and maybe cobweb patterns down here. But if you use a scale that is large enough, perhaps a billion light years cubed, you would find that any given volume contains about the same number of galaxies. If you're curious, you can take this redshift and multiply it by 13.7 billion light years to find out how far this radius actually extends. By my calculation, the circle is about 2 billion light years in radius. So when they say that the universe is homogeneous, it means that it has a uniform scale on an extraordinarily large scales. Uniform density, sorry, on extraordinarily large scales, but when you zoom in to the resolution where we live, we have diffuse gases and dense metals, and the density varies from point to point. Okay, this might be a reasonable place to pause the video and let that sink in, because I'm going to go on to a completely different topic related to density, the continuity equation. On page 306 of our text, we have the continuity equation, which states that for an incompressible fluid, a1 V1 equals A2 V2. Both of these values equate to the amount of volume coming through a coming through a pipe over a given amount of time. And you can see this by A1 and A2 are cross-sectional area. So this is going to be meters squared times how fast it's moving, meters per second. Now, I'd like to relate the continuity equation to an equation that appears in chapter 17, equation 17.2, which states that the current, I, is equal to n q v sub d a. Okay, so this n, I would have called rho sub carrier. It is the volumetric charge carrier density. What it's telling you is how many free charge carriers there are in a substance per cubic meter. Here, for instance, is the chemical diagram of a copper atom. In its nucleus, it has 29 protons and 35 neutrons. Outside the nucleus are 29 electrons buzzing around in a big cloud. 28 of those electrons will buzz around quickly but never leave home. However, one of these electrons is a wanderer. The word for these wanderers is valence shell electrons. The word for these wanderers is valence shell electrons. The number of these valence electrons in any given volume of material is the number of charge carriers per unit volume 
or what I've already been calling it, the volumetric charge carrier density, which I have written here as rho sub carrier, but the book refers to as n. Now we're going to take that number of, <coughs> so we're going to take that volumetric charge carrier density and multiply it by the charge of the individual carrier to get to get just simply the volumetric charge density. So that those two together will be coulombs per meter cubed. So we have this wire of charge and it's got that charge carrier density inside it and it's also got a cross-sectional area. Um, if I multiply that charge carrier density times the area, I'm going to get coulombs per meter cubed times meter squared, and that comes out to be just coulombs per meter. So now we have the linear charge density. Finally, I'm going to multiply that by the value of V sub D, which is in meters per second, and yields a value of coulombs per second. V sub d is called the drift velocity of the electrons. In general, it is surprisingly slow. In fact, if you compare the drift velocity to the thermal velocity of the electrons, you'll find it is much slower than the thermal velocity. You can think of it this way. You have a, an extremely slowly moving army of electrons, but they are numbered in the billions of billions of billions. You can um, even though the individual electron takes an hour to complete the circuit, the current is still measured as billions of billions of billions of electrons each hour. But really the electrons aren't moving, aren't moving that slowly. They're moving extremely quickly, but like a herd of chickens. Let's see if I can get this to... Okay, I think I got it now. If I put the electric field over to the right, the electron drifts to the left. If I push it to the left, it drifts to the right. All that jangling going back and forth is due to um, all of that jangling back and forth is due mostly to thermal effects, random collisions with other particles. But by changing the electric field, I can get it to go um, have its average motion start to go back and forth. Anyway, that thermal of the mo that thermal motion of the electrons does have an effect on the resistance of the material. In general, the higher the temperature means uh, the higher the resistance. There are some situations where that general property doesn't hold quite right, and there are some fascinating substances called superconductors, where if the temperature goes below some critical level. Um, then the uh, resistance goes goes all the way to zero. These are superconductors when you just need to give the electron an initial nudge and it keeps going through the circuit keeping the current flowing without any applied voltage. Unfortunately the whole business of superconductivity is a bit beyond me and the level of the course. The main thing I wanted to mention was that these superconductive substances operate when their temperatures, and thus the thermal energy of the electrons, is very low. And so in those cases, the drift speed of the electrons may exceed the random thermal motion speed. I hope you have found this discussion of charge density and current interesting and informative.